It shines a light onto many deceptive and unethical activities that otherwise would have remained secret, and it raises important issues about the future of the National Party. I haven't seen the book, I haven't read the book, I've got no idea what he's got in it. But we see, what, we've, what, <laughs> what we've said is that it's inappropriate to have stolen material published for the world to see. Have you talked to your lawyers already? No, I'm not prepared to say any more at the moment. Well, there's nothing made these emails here. Are you a liar, Dr. Branch? No, not knowingly. Not knowingly. Are, said, you, are you dishonest? No, I'm not. Are you concerned about the book for your reputation? No, I'm not because there's no truth in it. The 1980s and 1990s were turbulent times for New Zealanders. In 1984, a Labour government began wide-ranging free market reforms. Public services were privatised, unemployment rose, wages and welfare benefits dropped. After 1990, a national government continued with the new right agenda. The public health and education system suffered. In 1999, the free market radicals lost control of the government to a centre-left coalition. At the next election, the National Party suffered its worst defeat, winning only 21% of the vote. This has been a campaign that was a real test of character. <laughs> the new right were reduced to a fringe party, unable to attract 5% of the vote. Their only way back to power was to recapture control of a major party, the National Party. The first thing was to get rid of its more moderate centre-right leader. How was Bill English doing as your leader? Very well. You want to add anything to that? No. The party was short of cash to fight the next election. Mr. Mr. Rush, do you hear of some of the current rumblings of the leadership in this party? No. No, no. Don Brash, in the 1980s, had advised Finance Minister Roger Douglas on his new right reforms and was later appointed Governor of the Reserve Bank. He advocated privatisation, lower taxes and scrapping the minimum wage. He supported social welfare cuts initiated by his friend, National's New Right Finance Minister, Ruth Richardson. <laughs> Encouraged by Richardson, he became a National Party MP in July 2002. In mid-October 2003, polls showed support for National falling fast. Is he challenging you for the leadership? I don't have any comment on that. If he is, do you have the numbers to...? I don't have any comment on that. OK. Brash was still a novice MP. His bid for leadership was risky. New right activists rallied to support him. Brian Nicole, the ACT Party's campaign manager, called a PR man in Sydney, Brian Sinclair. Would he help? Sinclair agreed. He emailed Brash. At its core, politics is the art of persuasion. I look at it very simply along these lines. One, analyse the market and the competition. Two, design your product. Three, consistently package. Four, always ensure there is an emotive gut reaction to your product. Sinclair flew to Auckland and signed up as Brash's personal assistant. We need to have you supported and surrounded wherever you go. And we need to get a firm hand on your media, image and communications from day one. There has been speculation going back even before I was elected to Parliament last year that party members 
and MPs have believed that I would be able to provide stronger leadership than the current arrangements. Do I have the votes? I think I do. But uh, as I say, until that secret ballot is held, I can't be sure. The business elite got involved. Business Roundtable Deputy Chair Diane Foreman emailed Brash. Could you contact all your friends in the business community and ask them to lobby their MPs for you? I.e. no Brash, no money. If there's anything I or my friends can do to help, please let me know. Kindest regards, Diane. Trying to block Brash, Bill English brought the vote forward from Thursday to Tuesday. By the end of Monday's lobbying, Bill English needed just one more vote. That evening, backbench MP John Key visited English at his home in Wellington and asked what ranking he might expect if English stayed on as leader. Presumably satisfied, Key promised him his vote. At a pub over the road from Parliament, English's allies celebrated their forthcoming victory. I think Bill English has the numbers. I'm very confident that, uh, that Bill uh, has, has the numbers. Brash now had Brian Sinclair at his side, advising him on what to do and what to say. Uh, had a good sleep last night, actually. And not too much uh, phone on the night, uh, not too much phoning at night time. Brash's friend Michael Bassett, a new right minister of the 1980s Labour government, had told him which MPs to lobby and wrote a column for two major newspapers on the day of the vote. It's with a great sense of responsibility that I advise you that I've been elected this morning the leader of the National Party. John Key had switched his vote from English to brash. My first priority is the party. To lead an opposition with ideas that can uplift New Zealanders. To become Prime Minister in 18 months. Squeezing them, honestly. Come on, you can do better than that. It's not like a wedding picture. <laughs> yeah, it's just on the shoulder. Yeah. Uh, well, on the shoulder. Yeah, yeah, just... oh, come on. Okay. Yes. Okay. It's not like too goofy. Yeah. Just the action of the National Party has enormously increased the chances of there being a change of government at the next election. I think Don Brash could easily be Prime Minister in 18 months' time. He has spent a long part of his life uh, providing the basis for solid and growing and sustainable business, and I don't see him changing now. Leader Don Brash has plenty of party business to sort out, but on his first day in charge, he's already talking policy. Goodbye to Air New Zealand, to Television New Zealand, the power generators, Kiwi Bank, and Timberlands would also get the chop. For the life of me, I can't quite see the logic of the government owning a business which is operating in a very competitive environment. Everyone seems to be predicting that this is a move to the right for National. How do you see it yourself? Uh, to be honest, I'm not even quite sure these days what left-wing and right-wing means. I think there's a difference between uh, right and wrong. Between left and right, as I say, I'm not sure what it means. OK. You believe that people who can work, sh who can work, should be compelled to work in order to collect an unemployment benefit? You believe that? Uh, well, I think most people across the country resent the fact that people who are physically and mentally able to work can draw a benefit without limit, without time limit, uh, for doing nothing at all. Okay, I think th okay, that's a yes then. So you're saying take the corporate tax rate from 33 to 30 and the top personal tax rate from 39 to 30, which means a lot less income for the government. Where will the cuts be made? Uh, well, let's be clear about this. You could reduce the company tax rate and the top personal tax rates to 30 by using less than one third... Watching the new leader was economist Peter Keenan, Brash's newly appointed speechwriter. His immediate advice? Drop talk of tax cuts. Leave that to act. Brian Sinclair advised him to keep away from privatisation. Sir Roger Douglas and Business Roundtable head Roger Kerr urged Brash to avoid being painted as hard right. The advisers had begun repackaging the leader. Brian Sinclair asked some rich supporters to foot the bill for a new wardrobe. 
Sinclair knew the image he was after. Fashionable, chic, but in a very understated, classic, gentlemanly kind of way. Well-dressed, conservative, crisp, credible. And there's plenty of politicians in, uh, in Wellington who look like they've slept in their shirts. <laughs> The next step was to arrange positive media profiles. A former newspaper editor was now Don Brash's chief of staff. Richard Long knew Parliament, he knew the media as both the editor of the Dominion and political editor of the Dominion. And he was able to guide Don Brash through his, uh, his early days as the leader. And that's all, there's, there's nothing going to happen today in spite of what Radio News is. Richard Long didn't come down the press gallery corridor and try to tell us what to write. He didn't try and take us out for dinner. Uh, he didn't even necessarily ring us up and tell us when we'd got things wrong. I think it was more subtle than that. Your role is to try and massage the message, to get journalists to write what you would like them to write, to give your leader the lines that they can give to the public through the television cameras but not in a way that's going to make the journalists feel like they're being told what to do. Political commentator Colin James presented the repackaged Don Brash to his more intellectual readership. This was his first column after the coup. Brash's right-wing views were being played down. From now on, he'd be the honest, politically moderate gentleman. I feel like embarrassed. I feel like a minister. Yeah. <laughs> Reading parishioners as they go to church. Where are you from originally? Originally from Singapore. I've been in Singapore. Ah, yeah. My wife is Singaporean. I know that. Yeah. Hi. Good yeah. to meet you. How are you? Great. Where are you from? Uh, Forsyth Bar. Forsyth Bar. Okay. But you were born in New Zealand? Yeah, uh, I was born in Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Okay. Okay. My wife is from Singapore. Yeah. The new right had achieved a great deal. Their man was leading the opposition supported by a team committed to regaining power and completing their agenda. Personal assistant, Brian Sinclair. Speechwriter, Peter Keenan. Media manager, Richard Long. And managing caucus, Murray McCulley. The key strategic objective was to become players, to be in that mid-30s territory in the polls where People with a bit of casual arithmetic can see that, that you are part of a potential governing combination. To show momentum, the early public opinion polls needed to lift and lift again. Which political party would you vote for? The National Business Review, whose publisher Barry Coleman was a keen brash supporter, conducted the next political survey. When Coleman saw the early results, he emailed Brash this is the shot in the arm we've all been praying for. Matthew Hooten, part-time speechwriter for Brash, was quick to comment. You can do anything you like if you keep going up in the polls. And if you make big, bold moves, you will go up in the polls. If you don't take big, bold moves, you'll go down in the polls, and you won't be able to take any initiatives in the future. You'll become a prisoner of caucus. I figure, you have the next few weeks to establish which one it will be. A man who knew about big, bold moves was the New Zealand First Leader, Winston Peters. Immigration was what some political commentators called a sleeper issue. Let me tell you that this issue is now awake. You simply will not recognise this country in a very short time. At the same time as the National Business Review was conducting its next monthly public opinion poll, New Zealand First was delivering leaflets to Auckland homes, criticising the level of Asian immigration. New Zealand First went up, National down by 3%. What is the message from the NBR poll? Basically that Peter's immigration stunt has worked to boost New Zealand First, taking support from National. It would be great to have a big issue. Or to manufacture one like Peter's. The only real prospect is the foreshore issue. Six months earlier, the Court of Appeal had ruled that Iwi could take cases to the Māori Land Court, claiming ownership of the foreshore and seabed. The 
prospect of Māori control over beaches and harbours frightened many Pākehā. It's for everybody, it's for the whole of New Zealand. Why don't we join together and make a marvellous country? We do not want exclusive ownership of that to be vested in any single group to the detriment of any other group. It is ours and it should remain ours. Julie standing up for what I believe in. What we believe in is this, I fuck a papa to this whenua, to Aotearoa, we have a right. Peter Keenan thought about it overnight, then emailed Brash. What I have in mind is a major speech on race relations in this country, delivered at Ariwa. This sort of speech needs some serious time to work on. It needs to have an elevated tone, not day-to-day -day politics. It will come after a summer with demonstrations on beaches, so that should set it up well. On the 10th of January 2004, a group of visiting American senators met Don Brash and Foreign Affairs spokesperson Lockwood Smith at the Sheraton Hotel in Auckland. Brash had worked in Washington and felt at ease with American policymakers. Republican Senators Conrad Burns and Saxby Chambliss were strong advocates for America's nuclear defense establishment. Chambliss represented Georgia, home to 10 missile-carrying Trident submarines. In 1986, after years of anti-nuclear protests, Parliament had passed a law making New Zealand nuclear-free. American politicians had never given up on getting the policy changed. Don Brash and Lockwood Smith believed their discussions with the senators would remain private. But a New Zealand foreign affairs official was taking notes. Over the summer, Peter Keenan had worked on the race relations speech he'd promised to Don Brash. He admired American right-wing author David Horowitz. He quoted Horowitz to Brash. The most potent weapons of political war are anger, fear and resentment. While Keenan completed the speech, Don Brash attended the annual celebrations of the prophet Ratana. Political war is about evoking emotions that favour one's goals. It is the ability to manipulate the public's feelings in support of your agenda while mobilizing passions of fear and resentment against your opponent. Peter Keenan used Horowitz's War of Emotions formula to evoke Pākehā fears and resentments about Māori. We are one country with many peoples, not simply a society of Pākehā and Māori where the minority has a birthright to the upper hand, as the Labour government seems to believe. Adam Mike. Adam Mike. Richard Long, Michael Bassett and Murray McCulley all read the Orewa speech and approved it. I, thank you. I think it is essential that every time we talk tough on issues, we also run hard with a compassionate line. Otherwise, we fail the political hygiene test. The indigenous culture of New Zealand will always have a special place in our emerging culture and will be cherished for that reason. I, mean, I, I think there is quite a lot of public support for what I'm saying. I think the, the important thing, though, is not to win public support by saying something which do long-term damage to the country. Oh, no. And I'm not doing that. No. There will be people, however, who will be uh, not terribly happy. Richard Long and his team had primed the media for a big splash. This is going to set out that uh, Don Brash can actually deliver the goods. The election is 18 months away, but they're effectively starting their campaign now, and they need a recipe for success. Over the last 20 years, the treaty has been wrenched out of its 1840s context and become the plaything of those who would divide New Zealand from one another, not unite us.
We are becoming a society that allows people to invent or rediscover beliefs for pecuniary gain. Iwi are developing a central role with respect to local government. They possess the power to veto many development projects, projects which could provide us all with jobs. This process is becoming deeply corrupt, with some requirements for consultation resulting in substantial payments in a system that looks nothing other, like nothing other than standover tactics. Where does all this stop? We will remove the anachronism of the Maori seats in Parliament. We will deal with the foreshore issue by legislating to return to the previous status quo. We intend also to remove divisive race-based features from legislation. The indigenous culture of New Zealand will always have a special place in our emerging culture and will be cherished for that reason. But we must build a modern, prosperous, democratic nation based on one rule for all. Thank you very much. A threshold that was crossed was, you know, basically a 20, 25 year, you know, liberal consensus that the direction that had been struck on treaty and race policy was exactly the, the most adaptive way that we could move forward as New Zealanders into the future. In the past decades there had been this slightly softening in tone um, in rhetoric um, and attitudes around treaty issues, um, settlements, uh, Māori issues more generally. Um, so I think that kind of deliberate maliciousness um, and the overt nature of it was new. But tonight you've said, um, no, let's just forget about uh, Māori cultural beliefs no, and no, things no, like no, that. No, 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 no. The team's strategy was unfolding according to plan. The reaction, of course, was that the intelligentsia uh, and the, some of the editorial writers were apoplectic with rage about it because it sort of upset 30 years of political correctness in New Zealand. I don't have any regret at all about the content of the speech. I looked at it very carefully, I read it of course, wrote it, uh, checked it with people who know the history well, and I feel comfortable with the accuracy. What do you say to people who accuse you now of Māori bashing? Well, I say to them, how can you possibly accuse me of Māori bashing when what I'm saying is I want all New Zealanders, Māori, non-Māori, to be treated equally. That can hardly be Māori bashing. Well, Dr Brash, New Zealand is perceived as having such a harmonious society. Surely it's a bit of a stretch to say that this country is racially divided. I think we're moving down a racially divided track. We've got more and more laws in New Zealand which give special preferences or special status to Maori New Zealanders, and I think that's a very dangerous direction. It gave permission to a whole lot of people um, to um, voice these kind of very ignorant and malicious kinds of attitudes and I think that put a lot of pressure on Māori communities that we're kind of back to square one at explaining all oh, right the treaty article one article two you know it took us back to a kind of square one if you like in our race relations the headlines were no longer about privatization and tax cuts for the rich a week after the speech, Nationals Caucus held a retreat in Whangarei. The feedback has been hugely positive um, and from a lot of non-National Party members, I uh, ring my office to uh, congratulate him on the tone of the speech. Without my input, this is a party bereft, absolutely bereft, of any Māori perspectives. And whether or not they think that's important, whether or not they even want that, it, I don't think it looks at all good for New Zealand in the 21st century. Georgina has reached the view that she can't support all aspects of that speech, or some aspects of that speech anyway. Uh, for that reason, I've decided she should not continue to hold the Maori Affairs portfolio or the associate spokesmanship for constitutional Treaty of Waitangi issues. My sense is that there's uh, a deep chasm between myself, the leader, and caucus on the place and role of the Treaty of Waitangi in New Zealand today. 
Georgina Tahuhu was replaced by Islam MP Jerry Brownlee. Maori are overrepresented in sad statistics throughout the country, and we do have to do something about that. What Don Brash has said is look to need rather than race. What you've done is you've made a whole lot of nervous, angry white people more nervous and more angry, and clear in their minds that Maori are getting something that they are not. They were clear about that before. I wasn't trying to instill fear. I don't want to encourage racial hatred or racial tension. You have said that you did not intend to take the National Party over to the right. I don't. This is right-wing populism. Do you think people, that the government must no. treat them on the basis of no. need, not no. race, no. is no. not no. right-wing no. no. populism? No. 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 Kim is not right-wing populism. Refusing, is not right -wing. refusing, Dr. Brash, to accept that treating people as discrete individuals may actually destroy a culture. Well, Do you accept that? No, I don't. There are a lot of people who have hailed your stance. To be frank, they are right-wing rednecks who are glad to think that you are sticking it to Maori, well, and you know that. Uh, that may well be right. The reaction to the speech suggests there's a huge number of New Zealanders, Maori and non-Maori, who are saying, thank heavens, this is being said. <laughs> In order to dominate the public stage from time to time, we need to give the media a sense that there is a game on. That means we roll a story out over several days or weeks. It is our ability to manage our message which will be critical. The day before Waitangi Day, an opportunity to extend the message presented itself. The Teiti Marae board said they would only allow some Māori media to cover the traditional welcome to the lower Marae. If it turns out that mainstream media are not allowed onto the media, onto the Marae, I'd, ex I'd propose not to go onto the Marae myself. And there are things which we no doubt we need to hear. No is a racist pig! Come forward, come forward. Excuse me, there's no loud on here. Yeah. Move out, please. Okay. No, no media allowed. Sorry, Dr. Fresh, what's, what's the situation? Yeah. It appears that the uh, mainstream media... <laughs> Not a bad shot. <laughs> Where are you taking them to? Well, I guess it reflects a concern that people have. They don't understand my position. I would like to have been engaged in a constructive conversation with them. But if there is to be a racially based ban on the media, uh, I can't do that. And I regret that very much. Waitangi Day is a hugely important day in our history. Hugely important. And it's a sad thing that it's become a day of conflict and aggravation. We've got to move it well, back to a day which we celebrate. Racist mm. views, Mr. Brash. I, I, I think this is where some of the conflict is coming from. Okay, can we just keep moving, please, folks? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, nothing, nothing fundamentally wrong. You, um, no, I've changed my suit. You're you very wise. I Actually, I'll tell you what, it's at least another three percent. That's wonderful. <laughs> I, I said to Mitty, you're going to have to go down and, and say thank you to that young National Party supporter. <laughs> Brian Sinclair was also pleased, and so was Matthew Hooten. Kia ora. Kia ora. National's Me. campaign against special treatment for Māori seems to be paying off. 
National Underdong Brash is now the most popular party in the country, stripping support from Labour and New Zealand First. And this tells the story, our first One News Coal Mart Run and Poll of the Year, and National out ahead on 45, that's a 17-point jump since December. Labour, we see, have fallen from 45 to 38, they've dropped 7. In terms of the other parties, the year at the end of last year, New Zealand First have been on 11, they've fallen 5 look, to watch, 6. Watch, watch. Look at Don Brash, he's picked up 11 points to 24, and Winston Peters has fallen 4 to 9. So, what's caused all of this? Journalists began writing in depth articles about the speech. Richard Long was asked for the top 10 examples of race-based funding and what National would do differently. We need to come up with a credible holding answer for these that will avoid National gone to ground and can't answer type articles. Murray McCulley handled the problem. No, I can't provide detailed responses on the issues you've raised. Being thorough people, it is normally our practice to spend more than two weeks going through a consultative and deliberate process before announcing policy. Richard Long liked this response. He emailed it to staff. Attached is a reasonable response we can make to the nitpickers demanding instant detailed policy answers from us. Oh, well, I'm sure we can find a way around that. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Brash began a five-week tour of the country. Are you going to honour the treaty, Mr Brash? He suggested universities had a lower standard for Māori students than Pākehā. Māori New Zealanders are sometimes put in positions which they're not well qualified for. Non-Māori think they're incompetent because they're Māori. The reality is they're not qualified for the job. They are subjected while they're in the system to the same exams, the same workload, and they have to pass at the same rate as everybody else. When questioned about the education comment, you should explain that you are basically talking about perceptions. Slip into example anecdote mode when they attempt to nail you from now on. Well, I think there have been a number of examples in recent times. Sing along with Maori tapes, evening golf courses, personal grooming courses and so on, these are not the kind of courses which are going to make Māori, uh, enable Māori to get the kind of jobs which will raise their incomes. Soon, the government was also trying to appeal to the voters responding to Brash. They began to review the targeted programmes. For example, Closing the Gaps had been you know, quite openly looking at these disparities, trying to address them. Um, that all then came to an end, because so it was seen as too uh, politically uh, dangerous. Manaki Tawira, the uh, grants for helping Māori students were cut. And we also have in the disability sector this letter that went out to all the chief executives uh, saying you're no longer, you know, we've been directed from the Ministry of Health uh, to no longer have references to the treaty and plans, strategies at a DHB um, level. And those, that has specific effects um, on Māori and health and education. Big effects. There has been a misinterpretation and a misusing of that treaty by a sector in New Zealand that does have to stop because it is driving a wedge between the two groups in the population. The fact is that under the treaty there are rights, pre-existing rights, which were reaffirmed. The need which Māori now have often arose out of the breach of those rights. So to address Māori need, you're actually recognising that certain rights have been breached. And it seems to me to be quite wrong to therefore call the addressing of need based on a breach of rights as a special privilege. It's also wrong because it misinterprets our history where the taking of power, the taking of land from Māori, actually resulted in the privileging of Pākehā that the establishment of Pākehā institutions of power and Pākehā wealth was a privileging done at the expense of Māori. 
So perhaps we need a Minister of Race Relations to consider park our privilege rather than misinterpret <laughs> the gross breach of rights which our people have endured for over 160 years. New Zealand's next Prime Minister, Dr Don Brash. He was attracting big crowds, 400 in Masterton, 500 in Tauranga. Later, Peter Keenan, the originator and principal author of the Oriwa speech, wrote to Brian Sinclair, I hate the race-based privilege line. It's ludicrous when Maori are at the bottom of the heap. Watching from his summer home in the Gibston Valley near Queenstown was former Reagan security advisor Dick Allen. He was now on the Pentagon's policy board advising on the war in Iraq. Now I sit down in the, in the Gibston Valley down there, uh, pe people don't have the same attitudes that they seem to have in, in Wellington. There are a lot of Kiwis that support the United States who are not vocal. Uh, I wish you were really with us in this, but you're not, and that's an issue. Allen contacted Matthew Hooten, offering to help Brash's campaign. Hooten was keen. He's loaded, and he would be a useful back channel to his close friends Rumsfeld and Cheney when you're Prime Minister, or even before. Brash and his advisers flew south. The meeting was to be utterly secret. Allen was concerned as extreme views might taint Brash if word leaked out. Allen told them of a slogan he'd used in Reagan's 1980 presidential campaign. The values of family, neighborhood, work, peace, and freedom. The values of family, work, and neighborhood. In that community of shared values of family, work, neighborhood, peace and freedom. God bless America. Thank you. Thank you and good night. Peter Keenan was impressed. When we have you speaking on platforms, we would have a huge blue banner across the stage behind you with the words family, security, work, community, freedom. Then, we have to make sure that in all your speeches, you hit those buttons so that they become part of the subliminal view of National and Don Brash. Dick Allen recommended that if Brash was accused of right-wing extremism, he should say that he represented the mainstream of New Zealand values and thinking. Mainstream New Zealanders. I would like to see the free trade area agreement between our two countries stand or fall on the relationship between our two countries and that relationship could be improved if New Zealand had a different position on, on nuclear policy, if our ships could call in your ports, if you would change that. We need to be allies. We really need to be allies again. We'd like your support. Dick Allen urged Don Brash to deliver a speech sometime in the future about the need for stronger relations with the United States. Don Brash continued on his public speaking tour. He was also meeting local business groups and corporate heads. He told professional landlords the tenancy laws were weighted against them and needed reviewing. He spoke to health companies who wanted more public money for private hospitals and compulsory health insurance for everyone earning over $38,000. Brash and MP David Carter met top executives of the country's main cigarette company who wanted a stop to tax increases on tobacco, which were reducing sales. National's corporate power base was being rebuilt. Donations to the party and support in the media were encouraged. The market wants there to be a competition for the goodness of democracy, and I think they've got it. Whereas six months back, most people felt National could not win next year, I think many people now think we definitely can. Early in May, photographs taken in Iraq's Abu Ghraib prison began appearing in the media. National had supported the invasion of Iraq,
It was now that Foreign Affairs Minister Phil Goff released the notes taken when Lockwood Smith and Don Brash met visiting American senators. And then the report reads, it was here that Dr Brash made the throwaway comment that if the National Party was in government today, we would get rid of the nuclear propulsion section today, by lunchtime even. End quote. I don't see anything duplicitous in my behaviour. I've never denied what I said in January. I simply don't recall the words I used, and I've said that consistently. So the National Party policy on nuclear propelled vessels, would, they be, would it be gone by lunchtime? Would they be allowed back to our ports? I've made it very clear there will be no change in that policy without an explicit electoral mandate. There is no secret agenda. We are very open. I'd like to find a solution. So far, we've made no change in policy Dr. Brash, at all. So the chances are you made that comment because why? Two weeks later, Don Brash and Peter Keenan flew to Washington. The press was told the itinerary for their three-day trip had not been finalised. In fact, Dick Allen had arranged a series of meetings with officials critical of New Zealand's nuclear-free status. We talked about the relationship between New Zealand and the United States. Uh, he's clearly got a good regard for the work which successive governments have done in New Zealand uh, about economic reform and promoting free trade, but uh, the nuclear thing did not, uh, the word nuclear didn't, didn't appear at all. Brash and Keenan came home to worrying poll results. National was falling and Labour was now gaining. Another speech was called for, this time on law and order. We should be thinking of this as a key part of our pitch to the female and elderly constituencies. With any luck, all the liberal, pinky, lefty criminologists and psychologists and their flocks of friends and the chattering classes in the media will vigorously attack the speech. That should whip the issue along for a while. We will have paragraphs prepared for the front office to reply to all the mail that is likely to come in. They are worried that we might do another arriva on them. Every day, the media carry stories of horrendous crimes, appalling family violence resulting in death and disfigurement for women and children. We now have a class of serious repeat offenders who know no respect for other members of the community and whose actions leave us with but one sensible choice, to lock them up and throw away the key. <laughs> Parole is a failed experiment. <laughs> and the next national government will abolish parole as we know it. Well, there's some questions coming out now about the, uh, the death penalty, and I think that's getting a little bit towards, the, you know, overkill, pardon the pun. Um, but I think all his ideas are right. Everyone's sick of it. We've all had enough. We want to feel safe in our own homes. Dr. Brash's speech is a cynical exercise in vote buying. He wants to throw more and more New Zealanders on the scrap heap. For National, it has been crime and punishment, but tonight's poll shows it's had little effect. Let's have a look at the figures now. National is still ahead this poll, but it's down one to 43. Labour drops one as well from 40 down to 39, but there's still that four-point gap. This speech had far less impact because uh, many of the constituents that had already come across with the arriba on race were already sitting there supporting Brash, so he wasn't going to grow the pie by twigging emotion around law and order. By then also there was form, far more measured conversation around the treaty and race uh, issue and, and I just think that already people were starting to think, well maybe Brash is not quite you know, the leader we originally thought he was. By October, National had fallen behind Labour. Oh, we have to do better, no question about that. I, I take my full share of responsibility for that. But what do you have to do better? Uh, well, we have to raise our profile. You farming in this area? Polls showed men supported national, but they weren't attracting women. <laughs> Keenan sent the team articles about the feminine appeal of George W. Bush. The president himself said the W in his name stands for women. 
the team needed to find out more about female voters. When you think of the National Party, what images or thoughts spring to mind for you? Focus group research was commissioned. Women liked the anti-nuclear policy and New Zealand being clean and green. They thought National was too corporate, a boys club, which might scrap things like free childcare for preschoolers. There is the perception of National as a club for older white male business people. We look like a bunch of conservative honky males in suits. Instead of changing policy, National's all-male strategy team planned women-friendly photo opportunities to soften the image. A fundraising dinner at Wellington's Duxton Hotel was scheduled for early November 2004. Don Brash was to give the keynote speech. 230 invitations were posted out. Only two acceptances came back. I have seen him become, or at least gain the perception of becoming, a conventional National Party politician. Equally, you could argue that the more the electorate has got to know him, the less they like what they see. We have to deal with this perception of both funders and voters. If we do not, Don might as well pack up now and move on. Over the last weekend in October, Peter Keenan and Don Brash began an email discussion about the nature of right-wing politics and the crisis they faced. In my view, the problem is public perception of what National and Don Brash stand for, i.e. a return to the days of major reform, with privatisation, welfare cuts, spending cuts on core services, and another round of employment law reforms that will drive wages down. Raising the age of eligibility of superannuation is a huge political negative for us. We simply have to neutralise the political damage as best we can. I'm more than happy to debate that, and in particular whether it would be better to lie. I'm not at all sure what you're suggesting, agreeing with the undesirable things Labour is proposing, four weeks annual leave, total opposition to asset sales, total opposition to flattening the tax scale, etc., will get us there. I'm also left wondering what I will actually achieve by winning the election. Indeed, I'd much prefer to go and do something enjoyable and more lucrative than being a Prime Minister of a status quo government. I am not suggesting a need to lie. We just need a more nuanced way of talking about super issues. Sort out privatisation in the second term. The policies that National Brash stand for are not widely enough shared in the community to win an election. We are talking about the electorate's perceptions here, not the reality. Politics is war, and you have to choose the terrain that suits you. Hi there, Anne. On Monday, Don Brash asked team members to submit a strategy paper on winning the 2005 election. All the team agreed they needed to remove from public attention to inoculate some unpopular policies. Murray McCulley wanted superannuation inoculated before Christmas. Richard Long was worried about opposing four weeks annual leave. We frightened off those blue-collar male Labour voters that Don dragged across on Arewa. The strategists had also looked for vote-winning issues. Soft-centre voters are inherently self-interested. Election-winning behaviour requires you to slosh those funds around and buy your way to the Treasury benches. Our second big issue after one law for all has to be tax cuts. A bold statement promising big tax cuts, but without the detail. Peter Keenan was a fan of George W. Bush's strategist Carl Rove, also known as Bush's brain. Rove is an acknowledged master of negative politics. Rove believes there's no point in attacking a candidate on his weak points, you attack on his strong points. Do that right, and there's nothing left. The team agreed National should attack Prime Minister Helen Clark on her integrity and characterise her as arrogant. There was another crucial conclusion. 
After a year of declining polls, they decided it was time to call in overseas experts. The inoculations began immediately. The National Party has proved that it supports Finance Minister Michael Cullen's superannuation fund. In a policy U-turn, Don Brash today signed a letter committing National to maintaining the $6 billion fund if elected. It seems that New Zealanders really do want to see a tangible uh, fund out there which appears to give people more comfort. Two weeks later, National announced it now supported increasing annual leave from three to four weeks. National was also losing support to small right-wing Christian groups like the Destiny Party, which opposed a bill to recognize same-sex civil unions. Don Brash was supporting the bill and voted in favor after its first reading. A right-wing lobby group, the Maxim Institute, told Brash National could gain thousands of votes if he opposed the bill. The aim of the Civil Union Bill is to remove any type of distinction in law between marriage and any other relationship. And to me, that is, is, is totally in, 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 in the worst interest of children. After reading about the political advantages of George Bush's opposition to gay marriage, Don Brash carried out his own inoculation. Many hundreds of thousands of New Zealanders, indeed probably millions of New Zealanders, see this bill as a major attack on the institution of marriage. National leader Don Brash has withdrawn his support for the controversial civil union bill, which critics call gay marriage in drag. We are deeply disappointed. We believe that Don Brash's speech at Arua said one law for all Kiwis. We'd like to see civil unions go through to remove discrimination. In their search for overseas experts, the team looked to Australia. We will decide who comes to this country and the circumstances in which they come. Specialised polling by Linton Crosby and Mark Texter had persuaded John Howard to exploit voter fears of immigrants and terrorism. Crosby Texter had helped Howard to four election wins. National's general manager Stephen Joyce signed them up and quietly they set to work in Auckland and Hamilton conducting focus groups with what they called undecided, uninformed and indifferent soft voters. Soft voters thought New Zealand was headed in the right direction. They did not blame Helen Clark or her ministers for the problems they thought did exist. Then Crosby Textor prompted the groups. Regardless of your overall view of Helen Clark, what would you acknowledge are her weaknesses, even if they are slight and begrudging weaknesses? An emerging trend was identified, that perhaps Helen Clark was too busy with other people to worry about working families. Perhaps she was trying to cater to beneficiaries and focusing too much on minority issues. These perceptions will not exist and mature on their own and must be consistently demonstrated to be effective. Crosby Texter recommended that soft voters' fears about immigrants and Māori be linked to their embryonic doubts about Helen Clark and her government. National should continually demonstrate how Helen Clark and the Labour Party are focused on the noisy minorities at the expense of hard-working New Zealanders. Every opportunity should be taken to suggest the government was wasting taxpayers' money on minorities. Now, swear that I will be faithful. Eventually, doubts would grow in the minds of soft voters to the point where they would vote national. Crosby Texter's research was continued and strategy refined month by month until the election. The first target would be beneficiaries. Well, a dog whistle is a very high-pitched whistle that only dogs can hear, obviously. And if you apply it to politics, it's a, a speech or 
or a statement which is pitched at a certain group. If you want to say something that could be construed as racist or uh, that stigmatizes another group of society in some way, but you want your supporters to believe that you're on their side, you'll try and say something in a way that they'll understand what you mean, but the rest of the public won't. That's dog whistle politics. I woke up this morning and decided to try my hand at a speech on social welfare reform. Before he left on a Christmas holiday to Hawaii, Don Brash emailed a draft speech on welfare to Michael Bassett. It included ideas from a speech Bassett had given to ACT Party members. The overwhelming number of beneficiaries have been lured into this lifestyle by the ready availability of easy money. On New Year's Eve, Bassett responded. I retyped that draft and made it a little more political. He'd added phrases about beneficiaries ripping off the system and bludging off the rest of us. In January, the team agreed that Brash should deliver the welfare speech in three weeks' time at Oriwa. McCulley wrote the introduction. Labour's only response to welfare problems was to create more committees, institute reviews, develop plans, establish boards, expand regulation, and maintain an expensive beehive spin machine. Some of the ideas in the speech unsettled social welfare spokesperson Catherine Rich. She was assured changes would be made and the speech would be toned down. Peter Keenan worked on its emotional impact. Why should Kiwi families battling to get ahead in life have to support numerous people who are not making a similar effort? Examples were added about Pacific Island and Māori beneficiaries. The day before giving the Oriwa speech, Don Brash was again at Ratana. The prophet had remarkable visions. I too have a vision. I see a multicultural society where all people are treated equally under the law. We, as a country... Don Brash needs this speech to be successful. National's poll ratings have been sliding downwards for months now, and this is a golden opportunity to reverse that trend. Party members were urged to ring talkback and to write to newspapers applauding the speech. The welfare system is destroying many lives. Early Maori leaders, such as Rapa were especially worried about the effect of such welfare on Maori New Zealanders. An entrenched welfare culture has been allowed to emerge in this country, all too often accompanied by crime and family violence. The taxpayer cannot be expected to provide indefinite financial support to those who continue to bring children into the world with a blatant disregard for their own ability to look after them. The people Helen Clark has forgotten, the real Kiwi battlers, will find that the next national government will truly value and reward their efforts. I don't think things are going to change too much until people are really quite ashamed to admit they're on a benefit. Women going on to have further children while they're dependent on the domestic purposes benefit seems to me to be a clear evidence of a case where some stronger incentives need to be given uh, to dissuade that type of behaviour. In the end, she felt unable to agree uh, with some aspects of the Oriwa speech and in that sense I felt it unfair to ask her to sell that speech. Murray McCulley persuaded Brash to fire Catherine Rich as social welfare spokesperson. There's one thing is sure, we can't uh, maintain momentum in the polls if the leader of the party appears to be indecisive and weak. This means no woman on the front bench of the National Party. Is that an issue? I have no comment to make about that. Catherine Rich was replaced by Judith Collins. I think it's actually about having someone in here who 
is prepared to go through with the policies that the leader has stated, and I am very happy to do so. Let's look at National and Labour over the whole year, and we see that after that initial spurt from Oriwa, that was in February of last year, National throughout the year tracks down all the way to the end of the year, only picking up again this time round, once again after Oriwa. The opportunity was taken to promote brash supporter John Key to finance spokesperson. In March, he carried out another policy inoculation. Times have changed. The days of wholesale asset sales are gone. We do acknowledge that hundreds and thousands of Kiwis have, in good faith, established a relationship with Kiwi Bank. It is therefore our intention to keep the bank for at least our first term in office. Well done this morning. You were superb on morning report and the Dominion and Herald pieces are excellent. It's gone across as a sensible, moderate approach and another sensible inoculation. What we've got, I think, at the moment is people don't quite know what they're getting with, with National because you support the Cullen Fund, you support the Nuclear Ships Ban, you support four weeks annual leave, Kiwi Bank, you won't sell state assets, you're timid and coy about taxes. Where is the difference? Oh, how long have you got? The National Party and the caucus have overruled him and he's slowly being pulled back and we're not going to see the Don Brash that this country so desperately needs. Another Brash supporter was Telecom Chairman Roderick Dean. He had helped corporatise the public sector in the 1980s. Dean had promised generous financial support to Brash and Key, but now he wrote to them saying he was gravely disconcerted. These policy announcements would only lead to disillusionment amongst your business colleagues. Dean was one of a group of 10 or 12 individuals the team classed as high-value donors. Doug Myers, for many years New Zealand's richest man, worth over $500 million. He chaired the business roundtable from 1990 to 1997. Checkbooks are always open for political parties, so long as they get the, uh, you know, get the things right. You know. Alan Gibbs, worth hundreds of millions, masterminded a restructuring of the public health system. The central issue in our report is the creation of an internal market in the health system to set prices as a guide and control on management. Diane Foreman, New Zealand's richest woman, owns large private hospitals and heads the Private Hospital Association. I would just like to ask the people of New Zealand that are sort of reading the rich list and saying, you know, terrible, tall poppy, the whole bit, where would you be without all these people that work really hard, not because they want to surround themselves in luxury, but because they want to be generous and philanthropic to New Zealanders. David Richwhite's Merchant Bank handled the privatisation of many state assets, including the Bank of New Zealand, Telecom and New Zealand Rail. It's one of those transactions that I really think is a win-win-win was win for the New Zealand public when the Crown sold New Zealand Rail. I'd like to think, like every other good transaction, it's a win for the new owners, but at the long, in the long run, the New Zealand public will benefit from a, an improved railway network and operation. After receiving Roderick Dean's letter, Brash met him at a Wellington restaurant and assured him, despite the inoculations, their agenda had not changed. This is for table three. Cheers. Cheers. Dean continued as a major donor to National's campaign. The high-value donors gave their money to trusts, which passed it on anonymously to the party. Over one and a half million was to come in via the Waitemata and Ruahine trusts, both of P.O. Box 2244 Auckland. In public, senior party officials and MPs denied knowing the identity of donors but privately, they knew perfectly well who was writing the cheques. With the election less than five months away, there's uncomfortable reading for National and its leader. In the crucial party vote, Labour is on 45%, down one. National is on 34%, down four. The task ahead is formidable, but by no means impossible. We need to invest heavily in a bounce back. National had plenty of money, and the services of an award-winning advertising man, John Ansell, who'd worked for the ACT Party. I'm a distiller. That's all I do. I don't think up political policies, I think about how to boil them down.
We've got to win this argument about, about why money is good, why business is good. If we're going to change the polarity of New Zealand from a default socialist country to a default free market country. You can win if you package your policies in ways that shock soft centre voters into reassessing their prejudices. It's got to be powerful. Not leaders walking down beaches and talking to phony election meetings. A combination of simple words and strong graphics is the best way to create a lasting impression of a new idea. Ansel designed billboards, described as emphasising nationals' focus on the issues that matter for mainstream New Zealanders. The first went up in April. It was very important that they got the commentators uh, writing about them and talking about them because that got them into the mainstream media. So if you hadn't seen them on the road, you'd see them on the news at night. The commentary that said that they were clever was also approving because it's good to be clever and it reflects well on the party that was, uh, that was advertising that way. I think one of the nice ironies of the word Kiwi is that the word Iwi is a part of Kiwi. Uh, I, I'm not suggesting that non-Maori should have special rights. I'm saying all New Zealanders should have the same rights, both Maori New Zealanders and non-Maori New Zealanders. Iwi, three letters, means not um, a small group of people of a particular colour. It means privilege. And kiwi doesn't mean just a nice flightless bird, it means that old egalitarian thing of everybody being equal under the law. What it suggested was that Labour had, was somehow um, um, supportive of Māori rights and that National wasn't, um, when in fact, you know, not that long ago we'd had Forsha and Seabed Act, which very deliberately and specifically extinguished Māori rights. This billboard cost $1,500 per month and has a daily traffic count of 9,000. National rented 90 billboard sites nationwide, rotating the messages until election day. As well as high value donors, the team identified a second tier of medium value donors. We've made a commitment to get a major amendment to the RMA into Parliament within three months of becoming government. The Employment Relations Law Reform Act we envisage scrapping completely. Has this speech influenced how you might vote in the election? Um, I, yes, it has, definitely. Um, it's really nice to hear a little bit more detail about his um, approaches and, and national government's approach to improving New Zealand's uh, guess, industry. These donors were invited to private fundraising dinners. Media were excluded. A seat cost $500, a table $5,000. At one Auckland dinner, the pharmaceutical industry bought a table, private hospitals another, and the tobacco industry bought two. Speeches came from John Key or Don Brash. A national government will use the private sector to provide solutions to problems in the health sector and let private hospitals compete with state-run hospitals. We haven't got all the resources we could usefully use, hence this fundraising dinner tonight. But we are already better resourced than for many elections past. You can see the result in our current billboard campaign. That campaign has been made possible by the support of people like you. With an election coming up, the racing industry was lobbying for fair tax, a reduction in the tax on betting. On the 13th of July, at Napier's Tapania Hotel, Don Brash met a group of racing industry people. If elected, National would deliver the tax cut. Brash's staff worked with racing industry people on a campaign to spend $100,000 on mail-outs to punters and on advertising National's fair tax policy. Signage at racetracks across the country would promote national. Under the Electoral Finance Act, political parties had a cap on their spending in the three months prior to polling day. Any advertisement that encouraged a vote has to have an authorisation statement on it from that political party. So a third party wanting to do that would have need to have got authorisation from the party. 
None of the planned advertising was officially authorised and therefore included under national spending cap. An important race to be run during the election campaign was renamed the Party Vote National Stakes. <laughs> I'm not going to say whether I thought it was illegal or not, but um, the key questions are, was it an election advertisement? And that means, was it encouraging or persuading a vote? Um, the other question is, was it published? Was it a form of advertising? The wealthy Christian lobby group, the Maxim Institute, which had opposed same-sex civil unions and promoted private education, was also keen to get involved. Brian Sinclair met Maxim's Scott McMurray to discuss a $100,000 campaign aimed at shifting the evangelical Christian vote away from small Christian parties to national. Say, for example, I vote for a party and they don't win an electorate and they also don't get to 5%, they get to, say, 3%. 3%. What, what happens to my vote? At the last election, there were about 100,000 votes um, that, that were exactly in that category, whereby they didn't get a seat and they didn't get 5%. Mm. What happens to those votes is they, don't, they literally don't count. Therefore, should we place our vote with a party that's polling around 1, 2, 3%? And if you want your vote to count, that is, you want to be voting for a party that you know is going to represent you, mm. um, then you need to look very carefully to, to, to see whether they're going to win, that party is going to win a seat, or whether oh. they're going to get over 5%. Don Brash told churchgoers that National would provide more money for their private schools. Maxim promoted National as a strong, viable Christian party. Hey, thank you so much for coming in, Dr. Brash. I do appreciate your time. Born in Wanganui, mm -hmm. father, father was a Presbyterian minister, a pastor, a preacher. What is one thing that he taught you that you knew you had to pass on to your sons and your um, children? He believed passionately that God is love and that therefore uh, we should all be concerned about the well-being of people. The Exclusive Brethren, a religious sect that did not vote but had campaigned against civil unions, was impressed with Don Brash's Christian positioning. Early in election year, they began meeting Brash and John Key offering help. In April, they spent $350,000 distributing one million leaflets and on newspaper ads criticizing the government. A. Smith was named as authorizing the advertisement. This wake-up call campaign proved they could advertise on a large scale and remain anonymous. On the 30th of April, John Key met Brethren leaders Andrew Simmons and Mike Powell. Hello. Sorry, I'm late. Nice to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah, thanks, good. Good day. Um, these guys are from Sunday. Um, they're filming a documentary on me. Are you okay with them filming us? Uh, for the interview? Yeah, uh, just general stuff if you're okay with it. If you're not, it doesn't matter, we can do it yeah, properly. I'm okay with them doing it for the interview, no. Okay, no, okay, no problems. Um, that's fine? Cool. So you got... The Brethren plan to spend $1 million on seven more leaflets to be distributed just before the election. They wrote to Key and Brash. With the sole goal of getting party votes for National, our campaign creates mistrust in the current government. It builds trust in a Don Brash-led government. Brash invited Andrew Simmons' brother Neville to his home. It is not clear whether Brash saw the leaflets. The drafts were strongly pro-National, with pictures of Brash. They would have to be authorised by the party and included in National's campaign budget, pushing them over the legal limit. The third parties could do negative advertising and as long as they had their own authorisation statement on it, they didn't need an authorisation statement from a political party. If it's negative, then it doesn't come into a party's constraint and there was no regulation on what a third party could spend. National Party staff helped redesign the leaflets to avoid the constraints. Instead of saying, vote national, they attacked Labour and the Greens and called on voters to change the government. Separately, National would complete the message. To change the government, party vote national. There was no mention of national or the exclusive brethren. The team wanted tax cuts to be a big election issue, 
But early polls showed it wasn't a concern for voters. I would even be happy to pay more tax if we had free primary health care. To turn this around, Crosby Texter emphasised message discipline, repeating key ideas aimed at soft voters. And I think the line that we should be running is to say, you know, that the public will be asking some soul-searching questions of whether they've been delivered $50 billion worth of additional benefits, whether the majority of this has simply been wasted on the um, spending binge that the government's been on, you know, hip-hop tours and all that sort of stuff, you know. Drag that stuff in. Detoxing the message and getting it down to a soundbite that people can understand is hugely important. And I think where, where, where did you learn that? Well, you just learn on the job, don't you? But I think examples work. I mean, the example that, you know, the, the Wananga was getting more funding last year than Auckland University, that sort of analogy, helps uh, people understand the quantum of the message that you're talking about. Peter Keenan prepared cards for Brash to be kept in his pocket and referred to before interviews. A longer version and a shorter one for the 11 second sound bite. There will be no change in the anti-nuclear legislation without a referendum. That's the end of the matter. I think most New Zealanders do in fact want to know about the tax relief they can get from us, they get none from Labour, about welfare, about education, about the treaty. Those are the issues which concern mainstream New Zealanders and their families. As well as repetition, Crosby Texter told Brash to reframe questions back to the campaign message. Would you have sent troops to Iraq? I say this is a diversionary tactic by Helen Clark that's not relevant. But basic, would you have sent the, the would you basic, have sent troops the, to Iraq, Dr. Brash? The issue right now today is about Labour's wasting hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayers' do, taxpayers' money. My question was, would you have sent troops to Iraq if you were the Prime Minister? And I'm telling you that the real issue today is not that issue in the past. That's essentially gone. Okay, but it is the question I'm asking you today, though. And I'm saying to you, the key issue today is the fact that government is wasting hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayers' money. That's the issue the media should be focused on. What about answering my question? As Prime Minister, would you have sent troops to Iraq, given some of the uh, flyers that are out today by the Labour Party? Look, the Labour Party is desperately harking back to issues which are no longer relevant at all. So are you saying you're not prepared to answer that question about whether you would have sent troops to Iraq or not? That's not the issue today. The issue today... But, it's, but it is the issue because I'm asking you it. Well, I'm sorry. I want to focus on the issue which is important right now to taxpayers, and that's waste of government spending to a huge degree. Labour has dropped the ball on the key election issue of tax, according to the latest One News Colmar Brunton poll. Voters believe tax cuts are affordable. 51% say by eliminating waste in the public service, and 42% thought budget surpluses could pay for them. Helen Clark, the prime money waster, and her sidekick, the Waste Master General, just loves spending taxpayers' money. Your money. With tax cuts established as an election issue, all the elements were in place. Negatives inoculated, money, third-party campaigns, messages aimed at soft voters, strong, simple imagery. <laughs> By the end of July, National had risen to three points ahead of Labour. <laughs> on the day of a photo opportunity at Western Springs Speedway, the Prime Minister announced the election would be in eight weeks. No problem at all. <laughs> on Saturday, the 17th of September, 2005. Okay, bring it on, folks. Yeah, well, the winner's wide. <laughs> <laughs> Just before the campaign launch, Brash gave a speech in Wanganui about immigration. It was titled, A Reasonable Middle Course. We do not want those who insist on their right to spit in the street or practice female circumcision or stone gays and adulterers to death. There's anger at how difficult Labour's bureaucracy makes it for people who at least appear to be exactly the kind of immigrants that we want to encourage. 
This fear of Islamist fundamentalism exacerbated when a Maori convert to Islam expresses admiration for Osama bin Laden, there is a resentment that too many immigrants, and especially those who arrive as refugees, go straight on to a benefit and live for years at the expense of hard-working New Zealand taxpayers. Yeah, it's a moderate policy, a middle-of-the-road policy. We think it strikes the right balance between meeting New Zealand's needs but making it very clear we're not opposed to all immigration. We're certainly not wanting a racist immigration policy. If the public of this country accord me the privilege of serving as Prime Minister after September 17, things will be different, very, very different. What did you, any one thing in particular that stood out for you in listening to the speech? The guy's integrity. As the campaign began, National was slipping in the polls. A few days before the tax policy was to be announced, John Key suggested increasing the cuts by $360 million. Peter Keenan disagreed. I don't think the extra few dollars at the lower end will make much difference to voting patterns. This pushes an already heavily massaged fiscal impulse up to the limits of credibility. But the tax cuts were increased for middle-income earners. This is a substantial package involving some $3.9 billion in revenue foregone by the third year. There is no doubt whatsoever that this package is affordable. It's the Clark Cullen Taxathon with your hosts, the Prime Money Waster and the Waste Master General. Thank you very much for your high taxation. Thank you very much. Thank you very, 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 very much. Thank you. John Ansell called this attack advertising with a little humour. Thank you very much for your petrol levies. Thank you very much, thank you very, very, very much. Thank you very much for your tax on bevies. Thank you very, very, very much. There was an online tax cut calculator. So what did you think of that? Excellent. Whole another car. Good enough to make you vote national? Uh, yeah, it's got my, uh, I'm convinced. We've had two and a half million hits on our website this week. We have 60 or 70 laptops set up around shopping malls around the country this week. And we think as people learn more about it, they'll be even more inclined to support the National Party. We want people in racing to dump this Labour government and give racing a fair tax by voting national. That's what we want. If you want a change of government, I urge you give your party vote to the National Party. It is time for a change of government. A national led government can deliver for hard working mainstream New Zealanders. Now say that again, tell me that. What is it? It's very simple. It's www.taxcuts.co.nz. In January last year, I gave a speech to the Ariwa Rotary Club on Treaty of Waitangi issues. Most ordinary New Zealanders have no idea where all the race-related consultative nonsense comes from. They wonder why it is that these days you can't seem to do anything without having to consult with local iwi. I'm shaking the hand of the next Prime Minister of New Zealand. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. Indeed. Keep going. Go yeah. well. Look forward to the coalition. Okay. On Friday, September the 2nd, in Invercargill, Don Brash met a group of exclusive brethren including John and Alvin Burgess. 
We just generally we're concerned about the decline in the country, the moral decline. Kind of needs to be arrested. So we appreciate what you could do. And that, yeah, yes. Thank you very much. Good. He also met Mark Simmons. Harry Dock, pretty good. Good to see you. We just did the second CB3. Policies. This is just for you, isn't it? It was two weeks to election day. That evening, all around the country, a leaflet attacking the Greens appeared in letterboxes. It was authorised by a Stephen Wynne. You know, it makes you wonder if it's one of those parties who believe that there is a moral obligation to lie to people before elections. But we just don't know. Brash's assistant, Anita Ferguson, prepared a response. As far as Don is aware, he has never met Stephen Wynne. If you want to talk dirty politics, you've come to the wrong party. Looks very national to me because it's all in blue. It all talks about use your party vote to change the government. It's got a big blue tick. What does that tell you? What does that tell the voters of New Zealand? Hello, Rod. How are you? Very well. Has this been planned? Not at all. <laughs> I'm doing my walkabout in Rotorua. What are you doing? We do. Now, about Rotorua. The English in that is not very good, so I know so couldn't that you didn't couldn't write be mine. That's right. Exactly it's, right. Not, it's not your writing, uh, but um, do you know who's responsible for it? I don't. What do you think then about the accusation from the Greens on this matter? Well, I suspect it's another dirty trick uh, accusation at National. We've had nothing to do with this at all. We don't engage in that kind of politics. On Tuesday. Ex-members of the Exclusive Brethren publicly identified Stephen Wynne as a member of the church. The party is in no way involved. I denied that yesterday. I'm denying it again today. We've had no involvement in the preparation of those pamphlets. Torturing those Maoris, are you? Having a nice cappuccino there? Yep, well, certainly have. Thank you. Well, I'd shake your hand if you weren't a racist. Okay. Anita Ferguson wrote a new response for Don Brash. Question. Have John Key and Don Brash met with members of the Exclusive Brethren? Answer. Dr Brash has met with the leaders of most church groups in the past months. He has listened to the concerns of many different groups of New Zealanders. The next day, Exclusive Brethren leaders called a press conference. The campaign that we've put out is our own initiative. No party have written, authorised, helped with the distribution, or financed it. Like hundreds of thousands of other Christians in New Zealand, we are deeply concerned, deeply concerned about the current government's immoral agenda. Andrew Simmons had been filmed meeting John Key at his electorate office. Real people's... Anybody from your group? First time, we went to see Dr Don Brash for a formal appointment. We put forward five policies we thought would be prosperous for the country. Um, could be as long as 18 months ago. He always says he's pleased and uh, pleased to the support, pleased to the interest and pleased to see us. Dr Brash, have you met with the Exclusive Brethren at all? I have met with a number of groups, including the Exclusive Brethren. Uh, I've met with church groups, I've met with farmers, I've met with trade unionists, I've met with a whole range of people. How recently did you meet with them? Uh, how recently did I meet with them? I can't honestly tell you. I think I met with them about a month ago. Did they tell you about their plans for the pamphlet um, drop? Okay. Did, did they tell you anything about that? Thanks. That night, Richard Long wrote a set of lines for Brash. Answer. They mentioned they were so concerned about Labour's policies, they intended to distribute pamphlets attacking the government. If questioning persisted, Richard Long advised feigning irritation. Look, this is getting absurd. First, Labour said National was in the hands of the Americans, then we were in the hands of the Australians, then in the hands of the Business Round Table and ACT. Now we're supposed to be in the hands of the Brethren. Frankly, I'm getting fed up with it. In the last month, we've been accused of being in the pockets of the Americans, then of the Australians, then of the Business Round Table, then of ACT, then of the Exclusive Brethren. 
The exclusive brethren have told me for some time back that they were thoroughly fed up with this government and they would be distributing some pamphlets. I didn't read the pamphlets, I didn't fund the pamphlets, I didn't distribute the pamphlets, but they said they were opposed to the, this government and I said that's great. National Leader, Don Brash. Good evening. Why didn't you tell the truth from the beginning? Oh, I did. I've never seen that pamphlet until Monday this week when Rod Donald waved it in front of my face in Rotorua. Would you accept that, whatever you call it, political naivety, dishonesty, that you no. have misled the New Zealand public? No, I would not. No, I would not. I didn't, I don't retreat from any statement I made this week. You have stumbled at a critical point in this campaign. I, I reject that completely. I'm more than happy to tell New Zealanders the National Party can offer them a tax package which is hugely beneficial to 85% of taxpayers. That we're happy to treat Are people... Are you going to apologise to the public of New Zealand? No! No, I'm not. I, I told... I said nothing which was untrue. I'm an 85 I now I sell... In the last days of the campaign, the Brethren delivered six more leaflets nationwide. We're campaigning on the important issues facing this country and we will continue to focus on the important issues facing this country. Look at the final One News comma Brunton poll before election day. National up three points from last week to 44. Labour drops one to 38, which gives National a six point lead. <laughs> You don't get far in the real world if you're not trustworthy. I value my integrity and I don't put my name to anything unless I really believe in it. I'm very happy to put my name to the National Party's plans for New Zealand. If you want to return to hard-working New Zealand values, lower taxes and less waste, then my message to you is simple. Give your party vote to National tomorrow. Kia ora. Kia ora. votes ahead of National. That gives her 50 seats, National 49. Dr Brash, what's your mood? Disappointing response tonight. Dr Brash, the country's watching you, you want to save the country. I'd like to pay a tribute to a man whose name you may not know, namely John Ansell. Yeah. John Ansell was the marketing genius behind our billboards and our TV commercials yeah. to Brian Sinclair, my trusted assistant since I became leader to Stephen Joyce and the head office team can I pay tribute to those who made financial contributions to the campaign as well because that made it very possible and I'd like to thank all the New Zealanders who put their trust in the National Party by voting for National tonight. I decided to resign as leader with effect from a special caucus meeting to be held on Monday morning. In relation to the exclusive brethren, I never received uh, any correspondence. I wasn't aware of their campaign. Uh, I stand by everything I said. I've got nothing to hide. Uh, if, I had, if I did, I'd tell you up front. Um, I'm not stupid enough to, to know that uh, these things don't come out. 
Can I start by saying I am uh, honoured to have been selected as uh, the next leader of the New Zealand National Party. Can I also pay tribute uh, to the outgoing leader, uh, Don Brash, for his significant contribution uh, to the party. Can you confirm that you won't be allowing sort of outside influence like the Brethren, like people like Sinclair and that into your office to, to run your campaign? Yeah, well certainly neither of the first two you just mentioned will be any part of our campaign. A week after he became leader, John Key flew to Canberra. A meeting had been arranged with the political strategists, Crosby Texter. Key signed them up. Work began immediately on his two-year campaign to become Prime Minister. When I write about these kind of politics, one of my fears is that ordinary people will look at it and it will just reinforce their feelings of not liking politics and put them off. Whereas I see it, see it should be exactly the opposite, that the reason why we look into these things, apart from holding the politicians accountable, is that people can learn how it works and in a sense that's the greatest defence against them. And that's my belief, that if people are literate, if they understand the kind of tactics that are used against them, if they know what's going on, when a politician doesn't answer the question or seems to just repeat lines like hard-working New Zealanders over and over again, if they know what's going on there, then that's actually the best way that it can not have an effect on them and that they, and when the whole society can survive those kind of tactics. And so that's where I want to start, is to talk, look at that su subject of literacy. What are the things that we should notice in this? Now the first one that is, I think is pretty clear in the film is about repeating of lines. This is not what a normal person does. This is where politicians are taught to get a small number of statements. They've been chosen in effect to treat the public as dumb and that the idea is that by repetition saying hard-working New Zealanders deserve a tax cut enough times that that will drill its way into people's heads. And I would say the, the first thing to, 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 to think about that is to recognize what's happening, to think this is not normal behavior, this has been organized and scripted and insisted upon as what they call message discipline by the spin doctors around the politicians and we should treat it with the contempt it deserves. We shouldn't just let it wash over us and have us in the end thinking, oh well, us hard-working New Zealanders really do deserve a tax cut. So that would be the first thing I would look at. The next thing I would consider is is understanding the style of politics that they run. Because we all optimistically imagine that politicians are going to try to express what they believe in and try to persuade us of what they believe in. But what you see when you watch some sorts of politicians is that they're not doing what we would do. They're not actually talking about policies at all. They're not engaging in their vision for the future. They don't actually see that as part of their role at all. It's sort of a policy-free zone. And where they do have talk about policies, policies are tactics. The ways to attack people, to ridicule people, to outmaneuver people, but they're not the development of something to try to do their best for the country according to their view of the world. And so what we need to recognize here is that, again, as part of our literacy, is that the conduct of policy, politics is often a tactical process of attack politics. That's what they call it inside attack politics, fighting people, calling people names, trying to drag them down, trying to make them look stupid. 
Uh, it's not the business of forming policy that we might imagine. And when you understand this concept of negative politics or attack politics, you can see it going on. You can see it in Parliament. You understand that's what they're saying in that radio interview, in that TV interview. They're not addressing the question at all. They're just trying to wear down their opponents by tricky or humorous or repetitive attacks on them on this or that subject, which have probably got nothing to do with what the policies are and what's best for the country. The final thing which I think in terms of literacy we should be really conscious of is what goes on at election time, because that's when the politics is most acute. And that was where, ironically, a party like the National Party and, and the Hollow Men least wants to talk about policy. It's this paradox. You'd think that's when they were presenting their policies, but actually policy is a problem to them. And it's a problem to them because lots of what they want to do once they're in government is not what the public would like them to be saying and doing. And so this game begins. And we should understand, if we understand the steps of this, again, we can see through it and we know what's going on. The first thing is, the huge effort goes into just not talking about things, not communicating, not putting forward policy. And they're aided the better, and the better than this by, by the journalists not asking them questions. And they kind of rely on this. In other words, if there's a difficult issue and it doesn't suit them to discuss it, they simply don't discuss it. And unless somebody makes it their business to challenge them, a journalist, an interest group or other politicians, they get away without discussing it at all. So that's the hidden policies. The next thing they're trying to do is to obscure policies, is to use language which softens and dulls it and, and, and sort of takes away our consciousness of what they're talking about. A classic case of this would be education at the moment. Rather than saying, we want to gradually privatise education and move resources from public education to private education, they use the word choice. They talk about we need more choice in education and parents deserve more choice and the parents deserve quality, which all sound good, but they don't tell you what they're going to do because what that means is, it means choice for them. That's the code word that means private education, more resources into private education, rich parents being able to do more for their kids. And so that's the next kind of thing you get in an election campaign is where they're going to say anything. You have to look through the cryptic language and basically think for yourself because you're not going to get it in a straight way. The third category of policies, which we should all look out for because they happen every election, and the National Party has just been through it at the time we we're recording this for this approach to the 2008 election, is what's called inoculations. That's their internal language for this. They never say that in public. They also call it swallowing dead rats. And these are the policies which they don't believe in and they really wish they didn't have to adopt but they know that they haven't been able to hide them or obscure them, and they're going to get hammered during the election campaign. This is things like in New Zealand, it's been a nuclear-free policy, it's been uh, privatisation, issues like that which they know are going to be unpopular with the public. And so what they do is they swallow their dead rats. You can see it about nine months or 12 months before the election, suddenly the party which has got unpopular policies will switch its position. They'll do quick little U-turns on them, and they'll put those off the agenda so they can't be attacked about them. Now, someone watching might think, well, good on them, they're responding to the public about this. Look, they've become quite reasonable on these policies, but you have to understand what's going on. The only reason that they're inoculating them is because they can't get away with hiding them and obscuring them, and they know they're unpopular. And a normal person would think, well, this, this suggests a pretty moderate, reasonable party coming up here, and they're concerned about things like a nuclear-free policy or the environment. We shouldn't be tricked by that. This is not an indication of a direction. It is simply a cynical closing down of policies that don't suit them. The final element of election policies, which we should all have our eyes wide open to, is the populist policies which they choose to put out there and to hammer and to repeat and repeat and repeat in their lines to the country. Now the thing about these is, the thing which is really um, I contemptible about these, is that often they're policies that they don't even believe in. I saw this in the Holy Men, that they were promoting tax policies which the individuals didn't believe in. They saw it as a necessary, manipulative way of winning votes, not what they'd gone into politics to achieve. And so a few populist policies, it might be race relations, or it might be tax, or an issue like that with a national party, national party kind of party, serve two functions. One, they appear to fill the policy vacuum. 
they make it look like they've got policies when in fact they're not talking about most things. And people who, who join in the discussion about tax cuts or whatever it is are unwittingly joining and not talking about all the other things which are probably more important. But the other thing is that they have to have some material, they have to have a simple populist thing, and so by flogging it and flogging it, their aim is that, that they will be able to define the election that way and have people not to think about the rest of the things that matter in their lives and shape their futures and that they care about the rest of the time. <coughs> and so in all those ways, not, this, is not a calcul this is not my interpretation of what they do, this is what the strategists sit around and decide, how can we hide this, how can we inoculate this, which populist policies will we use to get ourselves over the line and look like we've got a policy manifesto here. That's how they think about it. But if we understand those things, we see them for what they are, we can dismiss them when they're ridiculous, we can ignore them when they're not to the point, and we can make sure that we're not just kind of the dumb voters that they want us to be. One of the things that's really striking when you watch the, the spin doctors and the political operators up close is their complete contempt for the news media. They know that the news media, because of certain characteristics, is a pushover. When they go to the, see the parliamentary journalists, they call it feeding the chooks, because they find it so easy. And so it's good for us to understand the characteristics of journalism, which make it so susceptible to spinning and to manipulation, and seeing how it could be different, and what journalists themselves should be committing to do to make it better. Now, <coughs> the first characteristic of journalism, which anyone who watches the news will know, is it's reactive. Journalists aren't going out and thinking, what's the most important issue? What will I go and find out about? I know, I really, really must go and question such, so and so about such and such. No, practically every item of news that comes out in the day is something which someone's put there. It's the press releases arrived, the press conference was organised, the event was held, and that means that the power has shifted from the journalists to the people who make the news, the people who put out the press releases in the minister's office and the PR companies and the leader of the opposition's press officer, the people who are putting the stuff to journalists. Second thing is, there's a high reliance on quotation in our journalism. That is, the way you get a story right is, somebody said. Somebody said that crime is out of control in New Zealand and we have to take urgent measures. Now, that story is correct because somebody did say that, but it doesn't mean the person was correct. They might be saying crime's out of control because it suits them to emphasise that policy for some reason for themselves or to de-emphasise something else they're doing. And so the next thing that journalists should be thinking about is who is telling the truth? That it's not enough to just be faithful conduits for other people's spin. The journalists themselves should be trying to decide whether or not they're just being told a line. And if they are, they should do something about it. And the thing they should most often do about it is the thing that people sitting watching the news or reading it, I know because I hear them say it, are often crying out for those people to do, which is to just ask the right question. And this is something which in a realm of kind of reactive and quotation-based journalism, the journalists almost seem to forget, which is that the journalist has an amazing power. And that power is the power to ask questions. Now in many situations, what a journalist does with a politician is they walk up to them and they hold the tape recorder out and they say, could you please give me your comment on blah 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 that just happened. And what that actually means is, please give me your two sentences of prepared spin, which if you say them in nice neat little packages, I can slot into a story and you may as well not have had a journalist because it's just been straight from the spin doctor to the public. But in that way, the journalist has abdicated their responsibility and they've given up their greatest power, which is they can ask a follow-up question. They can say, hang on a moment, I thought that you said this this other time, and can you give, how can you back that up and show that's inconsistent with such and such, and, and all those other questions which the intelligent public is thinking, but the journalists so rarely seem to ask. So that's this next wonderful thing that journalists can do. The final thing is that journalists, even the good ones, are quite good at sort of fighting in the moment, going, hang on a moment, and trying to maybe notice what's going on, but they often don't notice the big picture, and that's where this experienced political operators doing their work, that's where the holy men, the things that we, that's going on in the, in the film and the book, are really operating. They may not get the today's press release in, they mightn't get the exact quote they want in the newspaper, but they're aiming for something much bigger than that. They're aiming to frame the issue. And, and journalists are quite attentive to what the quote is, and whether someone might be telling the truth or not on this day. 
but they seem to be almost blind to who's framing they're using. Framing means something like, this election is about tax, but that's not a fact. There's no truth or reality in that, except to the extent that people believe it. And if the journalists buy into someone's view that this election is about tax or whatever the subject is, then the person, the, the media manipulators who were trying to frame the issue in that way have won. One of the hopes that I have by showing so closely and in such gory detail how those politicians can act sometimes when they think they're not being watching, my hope is not to show that this is inevitable, but to show it can be different, to show people why it goes on like that, why politics feels as artificial and as manipulative as it does, because it is artificial and manipulative, but to show there's another way. And my belief is that one of the main messages that a young person watching this who's interested in politics or somebody who's heading into power thinks they'd like to be in parliament one day, one of the main messages they should take from this is not that it's inevitable, but look at it and decide they don't want to go down this road. That when, when you finish your career in this and you've managed to dodge the issues and avoid the difficult policies and ride the ride through there with all the tricks and twists and turns, if you look back on that, if a decent person looks back on that, they don't feel great pride. That was an achievement, but it wasn't an honourable achievement. And I, I know honourable examples of people, old politicians, who have this feeling that they didn't do something good. And what's the answer then? The answer is that you can do it another way. That in fact the public responds strongly and warmly to somebody who seems to tell the truth. And somebody who says, I'm prepared to say, I've made a mistake, takes some superficial hits from people who are just playing the attack politics games, but they're winning support and affection from the public. When you watch the tactics that the spin doctors and the political managers in, in these political parties use, there's an underlying idea, I believe, which is that they are treating the public as stupid. They're seeing the public as stupid. They're seeing us as people who care more about money than anything else, can be distracted off things, at short attention spans. Essentially, they see us as stupid. And I think it's really important to get a perspective on this. And I would argue that the way to view ourselves and other people, the optimistic way, is to see that yes, we can be stupid. We can be stupid in short-term ways, we can be tricked by things, we can get carried away in emotion when someone tells us that someone else has got more money or privilege than us, like those Maori special privileges or something that Don Brash raised at one point. But we're not only stupid, we're also intelligent. It's just like the rest of our lives, where we can be really dumb in our relationships and we can also be really clever. And I think that what politics is ultimately about with ourselves and in how a politician treats other people is whether we're trying to bring ours and find the stupid parts of ourselves or the intelligent, the, the wise parts of ourselves. And when in a society people, the best of people comes out, that's when you actually make progress and you have exciting policies and you get the, the kind of things which make people proud to be part of this country, the policies and the the facts on the ground of, of past people's efforts and care and, and, and thought for their fellow human beings and the environment and so on. And so I suppose the main answer to something like the whole, I mean, what do we do about it? Is that people have to be active in politics. They can't be repelled by it. They have to get out there and they have to do it differently. They have to show that they care through their, we have, we have to show that we care through our own actions. And I believe that people are naturally political animals. We're not apathetic. When someone's called apathetic, it means, I believe, usually, that they're disillusioned and they feel that they're left out of politics. But we're political animals, and what can we do? Well, our society is built on the actions of people who, who thought up what to do. It is through journalists being very good journalists and trying hard. It's through academics trying hard. It's through people joining political parties or human rights groups or community groups or environment groups and doing their bit in that. It's about people not thinking it won't make any difference when they don't like something, but actually writing letters to the paper, forming a group and talking about it, going and telling their politician why they think they're wrong. Now, it can feel in politics like the politicians don't care and they're pushing people away. And actually, it's easier for a politician when the public doesn't engage. It's easier when they don't get submissions and where people don't get on the radio and talk about it. And that's why they tend to encourage it and treat people as stupid. But when people get active, when 
all across society, whether you're a public servant or a teacher or a student or whatever you are, when people get active, that's when public, that's when politics becomes hopeful again, because you're not just leaving it to the politicians, and there's all this diversity of other forces. And the way I would say it, say it, see it is that rather than having a pessimistic view of history where you think powerful forces, manipulation, tricky, media doesn't do it, a bleak picture, you accept what's, what the problems are, you understand them as well as you can, but you realise that they're only half the picture. And the other half of the picture, which is why we live in a society which has got so much good and generosity and positive things, is because there's the work of all the multitudes of other people, in small groups and large groups and individually, working on politics and political issues and environmental issues and all of those things. And the world we live in is the, is the sum of those. It's all the negative influences, or the destructive, or the ignorant influences, and all the positive ones that go together. And whatever piece of history that we're in, the more of us who climb onto the positive side and do good things, the better the world that we're going to live in.